which finally brings us to Solo. So, much better movie than I thought it would be. Eric Blake's been saying the whole time it's unfair that, that Solo has to pay for um, Episode Eight, and it is unfair, but it's also necessary. My entire point in starting this whole rant was that the studios think it's because there's too much Star Wars when I'm saying if you gave people a good movie, you would make five, six hundred million dollars a week. If you gave somebody every if you gave somebody a good movie every week, certainly every month, you'd you'd you'd, you'd make your billion dollars twelve times a year instead of once a year. It's not a question of how often you make these movies. It's a question of how often you spit in the face of the people that go to see them. And more and more people are just simply saying, you know, I'm done with you. I'm done. Done. Finished. I'm done. And that's what happened prior to Solo. People basically said, no, not not going. I'm not not after episode eight. I'm not going. Not after they mocked the whole Jedi thing. Not after they mocked the whole fighter pilot thing. Not after they mocked the whole good and evil thing. After they they mocked all that, no, you're done. You can have your movie. Kathleen, you're right. The force is female. Knock yourself out. You, you, and the um, you and the feminists can become the, the the core audience of Star Wars. Now, um, T. Doc Lies says it took us an hour and a half to get to Solo. I agree. Um, and by the way, Eric, you say we punish a good thing to we destroy a good thing to punish a bad thing. We didn't know it was a good thing. Nobody knew what it was. When you and, and, and the movie was better than I thought it would be, but it's not a good movie, primarily because of the guy who's playing Han Solo. And also lazy writing. We'll talk about that just real quickly. There's a, probably a couple of minor spoilers in here, but if, you know they'd be spoilers if anybody cared. Uh, so since there have been so many missteps already, uh, it, at this point it's just completely academic. Nobody cares anymore. You've done it. You've destroyed it. It's gone. So um, at that point, I think most people just really don't care. So uh, as far as Solo goes... Here's the problem. Um, if you're going to give us a new version of an iconic character, I'll grant you that he doesn't have to do an impersonation, and maybe he doesn't even really need to look like him, but you've got to give us something to connect ourselves to him. Otherwise, it might as well be the examples of Dram Dinkelon or whoever. Right? If it's going to be Han Solo, you've got to give us something that connects us to Han Solo. And a perfect example of this was in um, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, I don't think that River Phoenix looks particularly like Harrison Ford in any way. And when you see River Phoenix on that opening scene in, in, uh, as a young Indiana Jones, you think, oh. And then there's a couple moments where River Phoenix, and one in particular, where he just makes that face, and the actor was good enough to absolutely capture that mannerism of Harrison Ford's, and then instantly, instantly, it's like, oh, that's, oh, that's Indiana Jones, obviously. It's, uh, that's obviously Indiana Jones. It's, it, that, I, I see it now. That, that, they could have done that, but the actor was so badly cast, he didn't look like a young Harrison Ford. He looked like a young Jack Black. He looked like Jack Black. He just, his, just didn't look like Harrison Ford. And, it, and he has to look a bit like Harrison Ford because Harrison Ford, I don't know how tall Harrison Ford is in real life, but this guy's, I think, 5'9 or something. And he just, he, people would talk about how they had to call on acting coaches. I don't think he was a bad actor. I just think he was a charisma-free actor. Um, he had no, at what point was he, was he Han Solo? I think, as somebody said, it took 90 minutes to get to him. I suspect that the first 20 or 30 minutes of that movie were the only parts of the movie that survived from the original directors because it was so awful. There were moments where you could catch a glimpse of him, but... He certainly wasn't there in any particular way. And let me give you another example of, of lazy writing. Okay? Here's, here's what I mean by lazy writing. So you've got this guy who's the smoothest, he's the smoothest wo- uh, charmer in the world. He's a lady killer, Han Solo. Right? And the backstory of Han Solo before he meets Leia in episode one whatever you want to call it, in the first movie in Star Wars. 
he's obviously a lady killer. He's exactly the kind of guy that, that women go for. He doesn't give a damn, and he's a rebel, and he's, he, he, he's, he, Han Solo is James Dean on a motorcycle. That's all he is. It's very simple. He's James Dean on a motorcycle. Everybody gets that. That's what he is. And, and Han Solo has never been in love before he met Princess Leia. Now, except for the fact that you could have given us in this movie, you could have done something with this character. And what you could have done was, you could have had him, in this movie, he's basically, a, 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 he's like a, a, a you know, a, a, a fainting adolescent. He's just, I love her so much, I love her so much, I love her so much. Oh, I'm a, I'll do anything for her. We don't see any reason why. We'll assume, okay, they were in living hell together. It'd be nice to see an example of it, but fine. We've got this crush on this absolutely nondescript person who I cannot remember and who, whose name I do not know and who really was just pretty boring. But okay, so we've got young Han Solo and he's 17 and he's crazy in love with um, with this girl and they're separated and he goes off and fights for the Empire for a while, which I liked, except that when he was fighting for the Empire, he was just a coward. He wasn't, he, he was just, he was, he was a fast talking coward and Han Solo is not a coward. And if you're going to make him a coward, you better show us how he went from being a coward to not being a coward. He's basically, I don't want to go out there and don't know what are we going to do. And Okay, fine. Um, and so if you were writing a story about this, what you would do if you had a writer on the staff is you would have had this love of his life at the end of the movie betray him so badly that he spends the time between the end of Solo and when he appears in the cantina scene in, in, in the Star Wars movie, that entire time, all he does is just slay women left and right because he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He, he's, not gonna, he's not gonna make that mistake again. He's never gonna get involved with a woman again. He basically gave her everything. Yeah, everybody's saying Lando was the swinger. Well, Lando was, Lando was smooth, but Lando was also fake. People can tell fake. He kisses Leia's hand and Leia, no, oh, that's kind of nice. But everybody knows he's, he's just bullshitting her. Everybody knows. It's like, the, 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 there's nothing to Lando, as we found out in this movie. There's really no, there's no there there. It's all, it's all flash. It's all outside. Um, so you've got this rogue, you know, this rogue. And she says, I, I like nice men. I'm a nice man. He is a nice man. But you wouldn't know it. So if you're going to give us a whiny adolescent a breathless Romeo, a 16-year-old smitten idiot, then you better show us how he went from that to being a cynical, pretend like I don't care, death wish loving kind of badass that he became in the first Star Wars movie. And they don't do that. They don't make the connection ever. Um, what Han Solo does in, in the Solo movie is he brags a lot. But he's not bragging from a place of confidence. He's bragging from a place of insecurity. I'm going to be the best pilot in the galaxy. Okay, that's the kind of thing a six-year-old says. When, when Han Solo in the cantina says to uh, Obi-Wan and to Luke that he's the best pilot in the galaxy, he is the best pilot in the galaxy because he did the... Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. And we get to see the Kessel Run. That was nice. It was all right. Pretty good. I still don't see what he did. You know? I would have thought. I would have thought. This idea, because look, just as a quick aside, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about this for two hours and then we're done. Um, just as a quick aside, the whole Kessel Run in, in, in 12 parsecs thing was a, was a mistake, a very simple, basic writer's mistake on the part of George Lucas in the script, because what George Lucas was looking for was a measure of time. He wanted to, see, he, like he thinks, like a light year. How long did it take? It took, four, it took us four light years to get here. It doesn't make sense, because light year is not a unit of time. It's a unit of distance. Same thing with a parsec. How long did it take you? Well, we did it in 12 parsecs. It sounds kind of science-y. Let's put that in. And after the movie was released, and it was such an enormous hit, every single person with a bit of an education said, wait a minute now. He didn't do it in under 12, but he didn't do it. He says, I did it in 12 parsecs. He didn't do it in time. He, you know, it's a mistake. So now we're going to cover our mistake 
and make it, he did it in that distance, which I'm okay with, which is kind of like the way they repaired the, the vents in the Death Star hole in the, in the universe by um, Rogue One, which I liked very much. I thought it was a great story. I thought it was really cool and very interesting. Very interesting. And, and a good ending. We don't get to know these people very well, but they, but they mattered and they died. And so good. That was a good movie. That was good storytelling. I think it's the best of the, I think it's the best thing since Empire Strikes Back, uh, Rogue One. Um, but no, we've got this guy who's full of, full of braggadocio and bluster. And what does he do in the Kessel Run? What does he do? He turns left someplace when everybody else goes straight? What does he do? All right, we're going to cut the corner off of this. Well, that's crazy. You're never going to get out here. You're never going to get past the maelstrom or whatever. All right. What does he do to get him out of the maelstrom? Is he the one who has the idea about the little extra drop of fuel? That's not, that's not piloting. That's engineering. If you're going to show us the Kessel Run, and you're going to tell the story of the greatest pilot in the galaxy, then doing the Kessel Run has to be connected with being the best pilot in the galaxy. In other words, the only reason he's the best pilot in the galaxy at the beginning of Star Wars is because he did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, and doing the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs should take unbelievable pilot skill. You see? It's not so hard. It's not so hard, really. If you're going to make the case for the greatest pilot in the galaxy, he has to have pilot skills. And he didn't have any pilot skills. We got caught in a gravitational well. Hey, I've never seen that before, really. Yeah. Oh, where she's at full power. We can't seem to escape the gravitational pull. Wow, how fresh. No kidding. If, if you've got that kind of budget and you want to make this, this, this adolescent into Han Solo, you got to break his heart. That's the first thing you have to do. And you have to show us exceptional, exceptional ability. And we never got to see the exceptional ability. What he should have done should have been the it should have been going through the asteroid field squared. He should have had to do the most unbelievable maneuvers imaginable and kept on going and being able to improvise and all the rest. What does he do? Oh, we're going to turn left here into the cloud. That's insane. Trust me, I got a good feeling about it. You'll never get past the maw. Oh, look, there's the maw. We're not going to get past the maw. We're stuck in the gravitational field. Give it full power. I'm already at full power. What are we going to do? I don't know. I guess it's over. Hey, I have an engineering idea. Don't we just happen to have a little extra fuel on board? Yes. Let's put that fuel into the engine, and that'll help us escape the gravitational pull of the uh, maw. Good idea. Let's do that. Somebody? Would somebody please go and do this so that I can make my reputation as best pilot in the galaxy? Okay, thanks. Got it. Now I've put it a little extra fuel into my engine, and now the, the Falcon gets out of there. And by the way, when the Falcon came roaring out of there and had that little shock wave, it was great. Okay, well, now you've done it. What have you done? I got us in a gravitational field that was going to kill us all, and it's only the sheer luck of us having this extra fuel on board because it wasn't part of the plan. I didn't plan it this way. That would have been something a good pilot would have done. But since he didn't plan it, it was an accident. So he's the best pilot in the galaxy because of an accident. Because of dumb luck. Lazy. 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 And they just, you know, what do you say? What do you say? I don't know. I, I, a lot of people think it's greed. I'm sure a lot of it's greed. Yeah, it's from the movie, but um, it's worse than greed. It's 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 indifference. And and it, and if it's greed, it sure is stupid greed. A well done, George. Well done, George. Wins the internet for today. What Han Solo should have done to be the best pilot in the galaxy, George got it. Is he should have reconfigured the deflector dish to fire a triter plionic induction pulse at the anomaly, and that would have destroyed it. You see, we're going to reverse the polarity of the uh, of the positronic force fields which protect the ship, and by channeling through the ion diodes, 
we'll be able to create an antiphase matter field that will expand through the space-time continuum, canceling out the vibration specifically with anti-gravity uh, gravitrons that will then allow for a brief moment uh, a, a quantum hole to appear in the universe that we will then be able to shift our way through using entanglement, and if everything goes just right, we'll get out of this mess. Okay, then. Okay. Uh, so. There you go. It's, if it's greedy, it sure is stupid greedy. Because if you gave it to the fans, you have to give it to me. I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. I, 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 I could have made that whole thing work. I'm just a basic, you know, it's just basic writing. If you'd wanted to save Star Wars, you'd give it to Plinkett. You'd give it to him. Let him write it. Let him direct it too, probably. Um, give it to a fan, and, and and give it to a smart fan, not a, not a fan who knows everything about the Star Wars universe, because that's not what Plinkett is. Give it to a fan who loves Star Wars, who knows how to tell a story. Knows how to tell a story. That's what you should do. But they didn't, and it's it's done. Right? It's done. It's gone. Uh, uh, Rollo Thomas says, can you imagine a sports franchise telling the fans they don't need them? I can, actually, Rollo. I can imagine a group of people, let's say, who are dedicated Americans and patriotic Americans, and most of them like football. It's the all-American sport, and they like to get together on the weekends with their big cars and tailgate and stuff and have fun and get drunk and shout around and, and slap each other on the back and, and, and sing the national anthem at the beginning of every game. And then I can imagine uh, a sporting franchise basically saying, well, we're not going to um, make a decision based on the people that come to see our football games. We're going to make a decision that's going to make progressives in San Francisco happy, people who not only have never been to a football game, but who despise the whole idea of football. Those are the people we're going to appeal to. That's what it would look like if it happened to a sports franchise. You would say, no, we're not going to fire these people for kneeling at a sporting event. They've got a perfect right to kneel at a sporting event. They do, but you don't understand really the difference between the government and the, and the, and the private sector, do you? Because um, Colin Kaepernick has a perfect right to kneel during the national anthem. And as long as the government is not preventing Colin Kaepernick from kneeling during the national anthem, no one is taking away his free speech. But when Colin Kaepernick refused to kneel for the national anthem, whether the point that he's kneeling over is good or not, and in, in, in this particular case, with 4% of the total black homicides up being killed by policemen under any circumstances whatsoever, he's not only slapping America in the face, he's slapping America in the face over something that doesn't exist. Uh, so... The NFL had to make a decision, and the decision they made was, all right, we'll just continue this. Okay. Because, you know, God knows there's not anybody who wants to play professional football out there. And if you have to fire 15, 20 guys, just make a, you don't just fire them off the bat. Say, like you now get to make a choice. Do you want to play football for the NFL, or do you want to take a knee during the, the um, national anthem? Which is your constitutional right, and you have every right to do. And if you want to do it outside the stadium, outside of our uniform, then you go right ahead. Knock yourself out. Knock yourself out. But we're not going to destroy our entire fan base because of your temper tantrum. I'm sorry if you don't feel like standing for the national anthem. Everybody stands for the national anthem. And if the idea of this country is so repulsive to you that you simply can't agree to stand on and, and, and have a football game over it, then maybe you should be making $20 million in, you know, Mongolia or Chechnya or Venezuela or someplace like that. So that's what it looks like when you say F you to your fans. And, um, and there's a lot of that going around, which is why I'm beginning to think more and more that the progressive movement is going to destroy itself, that the more talking they do... Uh, I get the sense that there's a real backlash, a real, like a, like a rumbling in the ground um, of people who've just had enough of this nonsense, just had enough. But I think the biggest point of all this whole ranting and raving is if, if progressivism and social justice warriors and all the rest of this leftism 
can destroy Star Wars and did and continues to, then I think the balance of the culture is finally tilted in our direction. In other words, if something as powerful and as pure and as good and as um, moving as Star Wars can be destroyed by progressivism, and it has been, then I think people have had enough of progressivism because people don't think about politics, but they do think about Star Wars, which is the entire reason that I spend every waking hour of mine working on putting together the atoms and molecules to get into the entertainment business and ride on this horse and not the one that's going in the wrong direction. People care about Star Wars. If I go out and make a movie about two people fighting with swords, it'll be seen by my friends, which of course is millions of people, but nevertheless, let's take somebody else for an example. Uh, it'll be seen by your friends. So it'll be seen by several thousand people, let's say. But if you go out there and make a, make a scene about sword fights, and you call it Star Wars, a new Padawan, now it's going to be seen by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, not because they're there to see your stupid sword fight, but they're because it's Star Wars, and they like Star Wars. Maybe they'll get some good Star Wars. And maybe you'll make good Star Wars. There is a Han Solo prequel on the web that's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. And he's much better than this clown. And again, uh, just for fun, um, look up... Uh, Look up um, Harrison Ford uh, or, or Han Solo impersonation, uh, and you'll see like an old video. It's like nine or ten years old. Almost looks like VHS, but it's a guy who's got the right kind of face. And while he gets the the tone of voice very close, it's the inflections. It's the it's the it's the uh, what's the word we're looking for? It's a theater term. I went to college to learn these terms. Um, <sighs> no, it's not just that he sounds like him. His mannerisms, his his essence is there. It, he looks like a he looks like the kind of guy that's going to get to be Harrison Han Solo. Just so we're clear, I wasn't expecting in the Han Solo movie for this guy to start out as Han Solo, but I expected him to start out as somebody who could become Han Solo, and he wasn't that. And he didn't really become Han Solo, but in a couple of moments, in a couple of moments, so it's bigger than cadence or swagger. It's it's an essence. It's a kind of a it's a um, it's a kind of a core of of a person's character. I've forgotten the term now. It'll come to me when I don't need it. Um, but again, you can start off solo by making him a swaggering loudmouth. Oh, thanks, Steve Darrow just posted it. He said this one. I don't know. I'm going to click the link. Uh, it's probably destroy everything. Uh, I'm just curious to see. I'm just going to glance at it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, if you're watching the show live, uh, the link is there and I'll put it into the YouTube uh, posting because uh, this guy, I, I really cannot recommend it highly enough. Just just click the link here if you're watching this live now. And uh, if you're not, um, I'll put it up on YouTube. Um, and just, just look at, look at 10 seconds of that, 10 seconds of it. And you'll see, this is what you should have done, you idiots. Look at him. Do I think Chris Pine managed it? I do. I think, I think Chris Pine surprised me because again, the trailer, like the trailer for, um, Rogue One, the trailer for the original Star Trek reboot had Kirk look like a guy who was nothing but a motorcycle riding brawler. And they tried to paint him as this rebel. They show him as a little kid driving the car. You know, it's like, okay, I know what it's going to be. He turned out to be great. I thought, I thought Chris Pine was a, is a great Kirk. And Chris Pine is a great Kirk because Chris Pine and, and the character of Captain Kirk in the, in the Kelvin timeline makes big mistakes and pays a big price. When he loses the Enterprise in, in a darkness... When he loses the command of his ship, I believed, I believed that this was the worst thing that ever happened to him or could happen to him. I believed it. And by the way, I didn't even see, I still have not seen um, the final 
of the Star Trek movies because it was directed by the director of Fast and Furious, and it was basically Fast and Furious on dilithium crystals. It was a motorcycle chase movie. I'm not interested in it. I don't care. And another thing, when the Enterprise gets destroyed in um, Search for Spock, I was in the movie theater when I saw that, and people gasped. And people gasped, and they, they, they got teary-eyed, and I was one of them. My God, you've blown up the ship. You've blown up the ship. Oh, you're going to give us another ship just like it? Okay. Then we'll blow up that one too. And then we'll blow up uh, Enterprise D. And then we'll blow up um, the Kelvin ship after two movies. Two movies. We've seen it for two movies. Now we get a new one. I don't care. I don't care. I've got nothing invested in this. You know, put some scars on that Enterprise, on the, on the Kelvin Enterprise. Make me care about that ship. Make it a person like it is in the, in the original series. Then I'll care. But you'll get to do that after episode three. Next time they're going to bring it out and they're going to destroy it in the first movie because that's even more lazy writing. Lazy, 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 lazy. But not bad writing. And if you look at the first of that Star Trek reboot, that mini movie with, um, oh, what's his name? Thor. Uh, that's right in front of my, I, I know this guy. Um, You know the one. When he plays Kirk's father, that little mini movie is great. It's great. And I care. I don't know why. Good acting and, and decent writing. But I cared about him giving his life for that. Chris Helmsworth, thanks. Um, I really did. I cared. Um, uh, so, anyway... Um, 